Yeah, so I, I, I was back in Dublin and I lived in this apartment in the city centre of Dublin and um, one morning I woke up with a, with a very strong hangover, which is not uncommon for Irish people. And okay. uh, I, I, uh, I went out, I had this tiny little balcony in, the, in my apartment and there mm -hmm. wasn't many balconies. There's not many balconies in Dublin because the weather is not really balcony weather, you know what I mean? However, I had okay. a little balcony. So I went out in the balcony to just get some fresh air and I was like gasping for air. And I swear, we, we used to never go on the balcony. The only things we would do in this balcony is just throw some rubbish out there on occasion, you know, like a broken TV or whatever. But as I was gasping... I was thinking like a, a cigarette is just a broken TV, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, you never had a TV breakdown? Uh, TVs break down. They used to break down. Remember, there used to be these big boxes. Anyway, so uh, I, um, I, I just I noticed that we had a great view of the city center of Dublin that we used to take for granted. And so I came back into my flatmates and I jokingly said to them that, uh, you know, we should do something funny from our balcony. What what can we do? And so we came up with this idea called Balcony TV. And the idea was hmm. that every day we do a little internet show from uh, our apartment balcony. But this was right when YouTube started. People didn't even know what YouTube was at the time. Um, and so I was very determined to have a new show every day of the week. And, and, and the idea was my flatmate would present the show and I'd film it in a very rough and ready way with my little camera. Okay. And then what happened was we, you know, we booked, we, my friend was in a band and I said, well, your band should play one song in the balcony and that can be Tuesday's show. But then what happened was bands from all over the country started contacting us, asking could they come up and play on our balcony. And so I decided to like just naturally let it become a music website. And so- How big was the balcony? Tiny, about the size of your little studio there, probably half the size of your little studio there, I'd say, quarter the size of your studio there. Um, so we basically, we filmed a new band on our balcony every single day for about five years. So that's about 2,000 shows, I'd say. 2,000 we'll, shows? On, are they yeah. on YouTube? Yeah, they're all on YouTube. And and the thing is, is that, um, uh, hold on, well, Sony may have taken them down recently, but a lot of them are still, they're, they're, all, they're all out there, if you know. What's the name, The Balcony Show? Balcony TV. The Balcony um, TV. Let me yeah. see if I find um, it. But, but, but hold on, Sony, Sony ruined it in the end, so whatever you is see. It a, is it a pink, pink, pink logo? Yeah, no, but it, they, they destroyed the logo and everything. It, it would upset me if I see it. But if you scroll down to the beginning or something, or popular or something, you might see. Oh, let me see. Some of it more. Believer. Um, but so, I mean, what, what, so after three months of doing Life Belgium, can't be. Don't watch the new ones. The new ones are not what it was. Not what it was. So where are the old ones? How do I find the old ones? Well, listen, don't worry about it. Listen, it's all controversial with Sony and stuff. They destroyed it. But that's, uh, but if you just want to hear the, the story narrative here. Um, Eight years ago? No, we did it for 12 years. We made 20,000 shows on balconies all over the world. 20? Oh, then you started going everywhere? Yeah, so people started emailing me going, oh my God, Balcony TV is amazing. It's a great way of showcasing local artists. We need a Balcony time TV out. here. Yeah, time out. Time out. Yeah. So you start a show on your balcony on YouTube. Yeah. It gets popular on YouTube. Well, people start, yeah, correct. And then because of that, you start receiving emails from bands all around the world saying, no, we, we want to come getting, to Well, we, we were getting emails from bands, certainly all over Ireland, that wanted to come up and play on our balcony. Okay. And, and, but then when bands were visiting Ireland, they also wanted to come up and play on our balcony. But then I started getting emails from people who were like, oh my God, you shouldn't do Balcony TV in our city. And in fact, I'm a mm -hmm. wannabe producer or I'm a producer and we should make Balcony TV in this city. And so to make a very long story short, we ended up launching Balcony TV in a hundred cities around the world. And we had a production wow. team in, in we had a different production team in a hundred different cities and they would all make shows. So we were making 50, 60, 70 shows a week on balconies all over the world. So how would you organize that? Well, <laughs> it was, was it like a bunch oh, of look, independent- Oh, I lost all my hair. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, did you have like a, a bunch of independent productions, old wind content, or you had like a- Yeah, we basically, we, we, so, so what happened was somebody would email me and they'd say, oh my God, you know, 
So especially when we started launching in different cities, then then certain then people would go, why is it not in our city? And she was like I a would, franchise. And then I would I, I would then I would say, well, why don't you why don't you make the show in your city? And then they would go and make a test show, and then I would give them the rights to produce the show in their cities. And um, but one of the requirements was is that if if you make it in the city, you have to make it in the city. You know what I mean? Um, but what it did was it gave the people in the cities kind of like a. Like it gave people kind of exclusivity of they owned their city, they owned the production in their city, which opened doors for them in that city. And so wow. we, we literally opened it. We did we did it in like Tokyo and Johannesburg and all over South America, Russia. Wow. Every, everywhere, really, you know. And so and it, was, it was amazing. I, you know, credit connections and friends with people all over the world because of that. You know? Did it, did it, st did it stay a, a small show in a small balcony or then it became like a super production as no, it well, became popular well, so the production was extremely simple and i i pushed for the productions in the other cities to be simple as well because i actually didn't okay. want people to be putting huge amounts of effort into it especially considering there was very little payoff apart from the kudos of doing it you know what i mean however as it evolved like certain cities then decided they wanted to do it like in more of a hd or better sound quality and stuff So, but the basic premise of the show was the same. It was always one shot, um, one shot, and okay. uh, there would be a presenter, and the presenter would quickly introduce the musical artist. The artist would play one song, and then there would be a little outro. But each show was about like five minutes long, you know. And all these episodes coming from all these cities. Yeah. Where would they be hosted on your YouTube channel or in yeah, their so, YouTube so channels? It, it, it was really strange and quite unique. It was so what. Uh, In, in the fact that we had one YouTube channel and we had like videos essentially being published from all over the world on this one YouTube channel. So what was interesting about that is, you know, you wow. know we the presenters were often speaking in their their language, yeah. you know what I mean? So uh -huh. if we did it we did it in Poland, so they're speaking in Polish and we're doing it in Russia and they're speaking in Russia. We did it in Ukraine, we did it everywhere. And and so That's it was crazy. all these different languages coming through to one channel. Um which you know was it was against any kind of we were there was nothing like it in the world uh yeah over that 10 12 years and we were very proud of the fact that we tried not to be too boutique -y, you know what i mean so there was there was there was a few other kind of big internet music shows one was called um the, uh, la blog attack which is a really cool french show And they would film like bands in unique locations. Ah, la blogothèque, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, fantastic show. Um, but they only had like kind of big-ish artists. And then there was a show in the UK called The Black Cab Sessions, and they would film bands in the back of a black cab. Um, but again, they'd only have kind of slightly big-ish artists. Whereas we kind of were, we would give, if artists were okay, we would give them a shot. Because we needed to have a new show every day of the week. So, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't be too like, oh, I'm sorry, you're not big enough. But because of that, we ended up filming, you know, one of the first performances of Ed Sheeran and Mumford and & Sons and, and every kind of version of them in every different country around the world, you know, like Just Stone or, you know, we, we, and we had all different types of people. Then we had kind of, we had kind of legends that would drop onto the balcony or we'd have children of legends that would drop onto the, it was just, it was, it was bizarre, 12 years. Wow. You know? And so you had like, 60 70 episodes from all around the world coming to you every week every week yeah and you would upload everything on youtube like all everything these videos YouTube. yeah everything on youtube and i mean eventually as it evolved i mean eventually 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 we raised investment for it and so um and it was very hard to what year that. 2012. so you started in 2002 six So like really in the early, early, early YouTube days. It was so early that I remember when I was going to, I had this idea for a one page website and I wanted it to be really simple and colorful. And I, there was a graphic design friend that I had in Dublin at the time. And we were trying to figure out how we would actually put the video online. And I remember th at the time there was this thing called QuickTime. <laughs> <laughs> and, there, and there was also there was also this thing called uh, Real Player, 
And um, uh, yeah, real we, player. We, so we were like, can we use real player? We have to use real player QuickTime. And then I looked around online and I found this website called YouTube. And I always remember going to the graphic designer and I said, I found this website called YouTube. Would, you, would, would this work? And I remember her like che checking it out and she was like, huh? She was like, I think this might work. And I was like, yeah, great. Um, so yeah, so it was, we were very much one of the first YouTube concepts. And then three months after we started it in 2006, we won the award for best music website in Ireland. Wow. And, uh, I'm just showing off here now, but you know, no, congrats. It's, it's like, it, it all ended in disaster anyway, so I could do this right now. Uh, and, then, and then two years after that, we got nominated for best viral video content at the Webby Awards, which are like the, like the, Did the Webby Internet. award exists already. Yeah. Wow. And so if you think about it, viral video in 2008, real player was, took me viral, far away. Viral video as a concept in 2008 was a, was a very much a new thing. So yep. the words viral video was a new thing. And so we were nominated in the best viral video category, which is pretty massive in hindsight. Um, but we yeah. were nominated, we were nominated against, I always remember, um, Chocolate Rain. Does anybody remember Chocolate Rain out there? You can, come on, Casey, you don't remember Chocolate Rain? Um, and we were nominated against um, Diet Coke and Mentos. Go on, bring up Chocolate Rain there. Bring it up. It's one of the first viral videos. Let me see. Chocolate rain. Yeah. How many, how many views with chocolate rain? Tay Zonday? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember. That was the guy who couldn't sing? <laughs> yeah, he, he just kind of sung in a funny way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember that. It rained. Build a tent and... That's long time ago, 16 years ago. 136 million views. Oops, sorry. 136 I, 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 million views. I think that video, that video had as much views as our 20,000 videos had combined. <laughs> wow. 136 million views. And Diet Coke and Mentos. That was another one we were nominated against. Remember Diet Coke and Mentos? Not at all. If you put a Mentos mint into a bottle of Diet Coke, the bottle yes, of yes, Diet yes, Coke yes. will explode. But somebody made a video of like, the, he coordinated all the bottles. So it created ah, this kind the of the domino amazing, effect. Something like that, yeah. Wow. It was a cool video though. It reminds me of the slow-mo guys. I love to, uh, to look at these guys. They try stuff and then they film it in super, super, yeah, super yeah, high-speed yeah, yeah, yeah. camera. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Chocolate yeah, rain. Exploding. So, uh, uh, then you, bec you become super popular with your show, The Balcony TV. It, it never became it, super popular, but it, the myth of it became... Okay, myth, on the YouTube. Myth of it became big because we were, we were in all these different... If you looked at it from an outside point of view, it probably looked like it was massive because it was all over the world. There's all these different cities and there was just endless amounts of content coming through it. And then, and then also. That's <coughs> amazing. This could have been oh. a, a, its own website. That's, that's the way no, Twitch no, started. No, we had our, we had our own website and all that kind of stuff. It all happened. But, um, but, uh, but then some artists went big, obviously after they performed on the show, not because of the show, but just by, yeah, yeah. The, the, just because we were filming so many shows. Uh -huh. The chances were we were eventually going to film somebody that went on to become massive and so you know ed sheeran mumford and sons people like that and so then if you if you if you then you wanted to be on the show because they're on the show you know what i mean and then just kept on that kind of thing you know so then how did it become part of sony hmm well um so uh so we eventually raised investments we raised a million dollars which was just wow ginormous and back and in the days it, that was it, it huge came, it came at a time when we'd been doing this for six years and hadn't managed to make a penny of the thing you know so when eventually it was raised, before youtube monetization yeah well yeah and our yeah but our view yeah yeah so we raised the money and then i had to move back to new york 
funny enough. And, um, and I, I was given a mission by our investors. And the mission was, I always remember they said this to me. I, we raised the money and I said, um, I had this three-year plan in my mind. And they said to me, no, 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 we don't want a three-year plan, Stephen. We want a one-year plan. We want you to spend this money as fast as you can. So then you can raise seven million in a year later. And then se- a year later, then you can raise 50 wow. million. And then a year later, you can sell it to YouTube for a billion or to Google for a billion. And I, and I remember Unlimited going- Limited money. <laughs> Yeah, so so I was like Brewster's millions in New York, just like going spend, 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 trying to make it really big, really fast. And uh, yeah, I failed at that. And at the at the last second, I made a I made a deal with essentially Sony. Um, How did you fail? Well, I didn't make it into this ginormous big thing that the investors wanted and stuff. And so then we ran out of money. And so when we ran out of money, it was like. I'm really speeding up. It was a very long story, but um, yeah. I'm, try- I'm trying to condense certain things here. But um, yeah, the last meeting I ever was going to have with it, I managed to uh, negotiate a deal with uh, Sony, essentially. And I got them to take it over um, okay. in exchange for its survival. And uh, I went working for them running Balcony TV. And at this point, we'd done it for nine years. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that was interesting. I worked for them for two or three years and then they let me go. So, uh, what, and then they, and then they destroyed the whole thing there afterwards, unfortunately, which is very sad for everybody involved. Cause, cause we became a, this big uh, global family of producers. And yes. everybody was very passionate about it. And so we had people in every single city and everybody loved doing it. And the bands loved being on it. The artists loved being on it. And we weren't discriminatory about any kind of music. We welcomed all kinds of music, all kinds of music. I mean, we literally had like choirs. We had um, opera singers, you know, hip hop, whatever. We had everything. And um, class, yeah, everything. And and also like it was fascinating as well as, you know, it was like from, from an Irish, you know, being from Ireland, you know, it's easy to see music as just through the the narrow focus of your own world, you know, and and if you're from Ireland, then maybe you see Britain as well and you see America, but then that's pretty much it. But Dalky TV let me know that, oh my God, they actually have a musical community in every place around the world. And in every place around the world, they've got artists that are big in those places. I may have not have heard of them, but they're very big in those places, you know? And in fact, our most watched video ever on Balkan TV, I think I had like 7 million views and um, I never even heard of the person, you know, so you never know. And how, so how did you, for, no, first of all, all these content from outside of Ireland, from everybody else, yeah. where is it? What do you mean? All the videos from the Japan people, from the... Dutch people from so it's, Azerbaijan, it's a, it's, 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 from Ukraine. It's, it's, it's very sad and it's very, it's very sad, right? But Sony, The Orchard, um, have delisted all the videos. So the videos all exist, but you can't necessarily find them on YouTube unless, unless you literally know that, which is very sad for the people who went into the, the effort of producing the shows. And very, sad, and very sad for the artists that traveled excitedly to go and play on the balcony you know we used to always say that we give every band their beatles rooftop moments do you know what i mean and there's some fantastic fantastic like endless amazing memories and moments from people all over the world who took part this was 12 years i, I would say that balcony tv was probably the best document of independent music all around the world over the course of that 12 years you know would you would you do it again uh, I wouldn't know how to do it again. Like it happened, like the idea happened by accident and then it kind of evolved in its own kind of, I mean, I, I always felt that I kind of, I let it, I nurtured it along um, a bit and I tried to get out of the way of how the idea was evolving. Um, would I do it again? Well, I think the music industry is awful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Uh, But how, uh, how did this, how did right. Sony screw it up? 
Okay, so I gotta be careful with my words here because I don't want to. Uh, uh, I want to be. I want to be careful with my words here. So the company that took it over was actually a company called the Orchard, and the Orchard yes. were half owned by Sony when they took it over, and then that's the distribution months, company. Yeah, and a few months later they became fully owned by Sony. So essentially, it was Sony, um, and uh, when so Sony eventually. So after doing this for 12 years, one day I got called into an office and they said to me, Stephen, look, we're letting you go. This was at a Friday at half past five kind of thing. It's kind of like a Jerry Maguire kind of thing. Of your own show. That's crazy. Yeah, 12 years, you know. And um, and soon after that, they told all the producers around the world who were making the shows that they no longer wanted them to make the shows, even though the people around the world were doing it mostly, out of, they were doing it out of passion, out of love for the music and stuff. So they were devastated. People all around the world were just completely and utterly heartbroken. I mean, and they were messaging me and they were like, what are we gonna do, Stephen? And I was like, listen, I'm, my hands are tied. Um, I don't know what I can, I don't know what I can say or do. I don't know, I don't know what I can say crazy. at this point. And then they uh, rebranded the thing. And then they decided to make their own version of the show inside. Uh, the pink one. In a warehouse with these kind of poppy stars, which, the show was called the show was the show was called balcony tv life can't be that yeah, the, the, the show was called balcony tv the point is the bands are playing on a balcony with the vista of the city so, so that's the, idea a new that, one. the idea that they made new shows inside not on a balcony it's just like it's just you know mind blown and the logo and all that that's that's got nothing to do with me but if you if you click videos and scroll back i do think that there are classic shows still there um if you go all the way back there they they there they, they they start becoming like the they're 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 what the shows look like back in that's the only one yeah that's in prague for example but i'm okay. sure i would need but the twenty thousand shows and the quality level is you know i am um, ready but yeah but no they've taken down loads of them and, and they've taken down all of them you know just there was twenty thousand shows and that is probably about 200 shows still up there um, so it's very upsetting, and I try not to think about it too much because otherwise I, you know, jump off a bridge or something. But uh, um, yeah, interesting. What can you do? So, uh, what did you do after that? Well, I lied under a blanket for about three months <laughs> 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 under my bed, and very much asked depressed. Myself, yeah, I was like, what? Well, you know, I spent you know, the majority of my adult life to that point doing it, and I was very proud of what it was and what it became, and it was a beautiful thing, and it created a lot of opportunities for people all over the world. Like, for example, the produce, like the presenters of the shows. A lot of the presenters went on to bigger things. The producers yeah. went on to bigger things and stuff. So it's not a bad thing. No, it was great for the people around the world, certainly. Mm -hmm. Poor old muggins here, you know. I, I was only I, I I suffered, you know what I mean? But um uh so what did I do? I, I decided um to go traveling around the world. And so I decided to go on a one hundred city tour around the world, and what I would do was I would actually go and visit every city where we did balcony TV and I would go meet the people in each city that actually okay. made the shows who I mostly just communicated with online. And, um, and so that's what I did. I went on a, I, I packed, I got rid of my apartment, packed my little suitcase, got a camera and went traveling around the world for a year and a half. And that was amazing. And with a camera in the hand. Camera in hand. And then I came back to New York where I was living and a year later, COVID broke out. And then when COVID broke out, I was essentially kicked out of New York. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's when I ended up in Lisbon because Lisbon was kind of the only, Portugal was one of the few places in the world that was actually open, that you were allowed to go to, that you were legally allowed to go to. And so that's what brought me to Lisbon. But I came very spontaneously, one-way flight, okay. checked into a hostel. And the week after I got to Lisbon, I thought, what am I gonna do with myself now? And this little idea popped into my mind called People of Lisbon. And my idea was that every week I'd make a little documentary about a different person that lives in Lisbon. And that's how I know you. 